Hello, my name is Ben. And I'm Nora. And we are your hosts of the Too Vague Podcast this week. One word, two hosts, stories, trivia, and video games. Hi, my name is Ben. Huh? (laughs) And I'm Nora. And we are your hosts of the Too Vague Podcast this week. One word, two hosts, stories, trivia, and video games. Hello, my name is Ben. And I'm Nora. (laughs) All right. right. (laughs) Trying to get it right. Is that right? I'm merely illustrating the word this week. Recursive. The word loop. I thought it would be funnier, but maybe it's not funny at all. Well, I didn't know what you were doing. I probably would have. Or maybe if you had done it four times, it would have been more, you know. But I, of course, didn't let you. I don't want to put the audience to sleep. I think, you know, two, three tops. Or put them off. Yeah. Yeah. Wait, there's something wrong with this podcast. I'm just going to turn it off. Hello. Yeah. My name is, you know. Right. I also thought if I would do it like too late in the podcast and do the same thing, you'd be like, what the hell? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. The word this week is the word loop. Loop. Let us get into, well, I don't know. Do you want to talk about the shows that you saw this week or do you want to just get right into the word? Uh, well, I, sh- I should say, you know, I, I go to see shows a lot yep. and we went to see Tommy, mm-hmm. the who, how old is that? Like 50 years old or something, more than 50. Yeah. It was wonderful. They changed it a little. Pete, Pete Townsend was in with the writing of the, the changes they did. Uh, he was in Chicago and, and worked with it, worked with the um, actors and stuff. It was wonderful. Mm-hmm. Even Anne, your stepmother, right, and her friend, who's even a little bit older, Enjoyed loved it. it. Yeah. yeah. And I thought the music would be too loud, but they tempered that. They, they only had one loud song at the end of Act One or something. Mm. But God, it was good. I mean, I was just take, rolling up my little program and just being a percussionist on my knee. You know? <laughs> <laughs> like you do. do, do, like do, you, do. Yeah, like yeah, you do yeah. with the show tunes or whatever. Yeah, so, yeah. so you saw these other musicals with Anne as well, right? Like the, the Jagged Little Pill and uh, what was the American Idiot you saw too? With Idiot. Her? Oh, yeah. Did yeah, she, she think- hated it. She hated American Idiot. Did she hate Jagged Little Pill as well? or No, she liked that she was pleasantly surprised that it was a story mm-hmm. about a middle-aged uh, mother right. who got hooked on Oxycontin. Yeah. And they, they played appropriate Alanis Morissette music right. to go with the, you know, the story. But there was a story with it. So it was a musical because there was plenty of music in it. But American Idiot, she just didn't like because it was too loud. Well, I thought it was too loud, but then she said that it was like a silly story or something like that. And yeah, it is a little bit. Um, I still say it's a copy of uh, Hair from the 60s. Oh, okay. Um, But just, uh... you know, there's uh, people who are bohemians and one of them goes off in the army and he comes back and you know everything's different anyway that seems to be a very common theme in most music not most but a lot of musicals have that kind of yeah idealistic kids and then one goes off to the army and comes back all messed up or whatever and or emotionally disturbed and and that's i mean that's very basic i'm sure there was more to it but Right, uh, right. but I love I love the music to American. Oh, well, I like Green Day, but I love American um, idiot music so much. I like American idiot music too. Sometimes we just call it music. Oh, <laughs> American. No, never, never, never mind. Yeah, 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 yeah. I get it. I get it. It's not like the Canadian idiot music. Yeah, I like a lot of Canadian. <laughs> Something that I learned about Canadian radio. I don't know if it's still in play. It seems like it probably would change with today's climate, but Uh they are required to play a certain number of Canadian artists, a certain percentage on the radio compared to other artists. So it's like, there's a quota that they have to have. That's great. Isn't that, it seems interesting and and kind of odd to me though. I mean, isn't music music? I think it's great. Probably a lot of Canadian uh, artists, music artists don't get enough play elsewhere. Like Celine they're, they're Dion? They're really great. <laughs> I'm sorry. I wasn't thinking of her. Uh, I was just thinking kidding. of some others. But... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like Rush. Uh, there's, you know, there's one or two in every genre. But 
I you know, I think it's great because I think that's just a good idea. Yeah. No, I'm, I I think it kind of makes sense. They also have their rec- the record stores. I knew the record store part of it we, because whenever I would go to the record store while I was in Canada, they had very clear markings that showed which artists were Canadian artists. Oh. So it would be like, you know how they have the, the titles, the different bands. Well, they would show right, on right. those the Canadian flag. Very interesting sort of thing. but Good. I don't have anything other than the game I'm playing currently to talk about as far as loop, but we can hold that. I have one thing. In, when we did the dystopian uh, show yeah. a month or so ago, right? I have to make a correction because I said something wrong. Okay. It's true that the army came through and burned my grandfather and his father's books. Right. I think I said it was Bolsheviks. It wasn't. At the time this happened, it was still the imperial army, the SARS army. Okay. The Bolsheviks were still trying to get footing at that time, but yeah. it was the SAR that did it. So okay. I, and I just don't want people to think I'm stupid oh. more than normal. <laughs> so, okay. All right. I'm glad you brought that up because we have been receiving thousands and thousands of emails. Okay. Well, good. Now you can set them straight. To two vague podcast at gmail.com. Jeez, I just can't. I had to silent them because it was just too many. No, I'm well, you just could just send them, send them on oh, to me. Forward yeah. them. Yeah, that's a great idea. Yeah. <laughs> hey, don't have enough spam? Here we go. <laughs> I just thought of one thing that I forgot to mention. As of this show, uh, it's been two years since we started the two vague podcast. I say we. Yes. But yeah, include, we means you and somebody else. I, but I include you in this because you were one of the very first listeners and also my aunt. Yeah, right. We don't have the questions from my aunt section too much anymore because we have my aunt on. Right. Do you know my aunt? Uh, pretty well, yeah. Oh, that's good. A weird, weird duck. Weird yeah. duck. Yeah. And I'm not doing autocorrect there. <laughs> yes, exactly. It's a callback. <laughs> Was it the dystopia show? I think it was the dystopia show, but anyway. So happy two years to you. And Yeah, uh, well, happy two years to you. I'm so I'm really glad that this has gone so well. Eh, you know, ups and downs. Yeah. There, there were times that it was a little more difficult to get people on the show. Yeah. It's, um I think it's more summer. It, <laughs> yeah. Summer's usually kind of tricky, but I do have some guests lined up. It's I'm trying to do it weekly, but there are things going on in my life. I want to maintain this as a hobby, and I want it to be fun. Putting a deadline on myself in addition to all the other deadlines that I have in my life. At this point in time, I don't think that that would make it enjoyable. So I am releasing every 10 days to two weeks. If I can get right. it weekly at some point or once in a while, I'll do it. But life happens, so. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Well, I can't believe how much fun I have on the show, too. Remember when I first, it was in July in uh, 2021, I think. Yeah. And you were here. Right. At my house and visiting, being a guest. Mm-hmm. I was feeding you. I was doing, and you bring out your darn podcast in a bag. <laughs> and and just ambushed me. Yeah. You know, and it's like, no, I, 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 I don't, I, yeah. And it took me a while, but man, I really enjoy doing these. Yeah, well, thank you. And I think you do really well. I have gotten people who listen to the show who say that they really enjoy you as a guest. So, so there we go. Thank them for me. <laughs> I will. I will thank them individually. <laughs> okay. Okay. Two years, hopefully more. Yeah, I hope so. So do you want to get into the word loop? Yes. I think we should. All right. Do you want to start out with the definition or do you have some preliminary thoughts on the word? Yeah, let's go with the definition. Okay. It's, it's such a simple definition. It's almost silly. I think it's Merriam Webster. I, sorry, I didn't go with Mr. Ford. Okay. You know, ox. Well, I handle the ox, you handle the web stir. Yeah. Anyway, a loop is, as a noun, a shape produced by a curve that bends around and crosses itself. Okay. Duh. Uh, and then the second, a second definition is a structure, series, or process, the end of which is connected to the beginning. Okay. And there's a verb, too. I love the verb. Form into a loop or loops. Thank you, Mr. Webster. Encircle is another one. 
I left some of the superfluous stuff out. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, th- those were the definitions. Those are pretty much what Ox agrees with. It's so simple. Yeah, it is simple. Uh, there are some variations I want to mention because we're going to be talking about them in the show. A curved stroke forming part of a letter. Okay. When you're writing cursive, something that no one does these days. Right. Or calligraphy. You've got loops that you draw. A maneuver in which an aircraft describes a vertical circle in the air. Yeah. Yeah. When you go to the air show, you got that. Also, the same thing for skating. An endless strip of tape or film allowing continuous repetition. Hmm. Ah, yes. You know, like on your answering machine. You remember those? You had the tape that had the loop of... Yeah. Where you could record your your outgoing message. Complete circuit in electrical current. Computing. You know, here's the one that I remember that I'm going to be bringing up a little bit. A program sequence of instructions that is repeated until or while a particular condition is satisfied. I think the rest we've got for... It's another one of those verbification sort of things, right? You're, you know. Right. Where the the noun and the verb are very, very similar and we just follow the same. Yeah, they are. Do you want to know what the origin of loop is? Yeah, I did not look that up. Well, it says late Middle English of unknown origin. Compare with Scottish Gaelic. Loop, lube, bend. Lub. Okay. I'm not good at Scottish. Lub? L-U-B? Yeah, L-U with a little accent above it. Yeah, yeah. I don't know how the accents are. Pronounced. Yeah. Lub. Lub. Now it just sounds like we're making fun of Scottish people. <laughs> I'm not trying to. No. Did you ever see the movie So I Married an Axe Murderer? I know I've mentioned it before. God. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't see too many movies, but that sounds familiar, maybe because you've talked about it. It's a Mike Myers film. You you, you probably would enjoy it. It's very much uh, a 90s sort of film about a person who is having problems falling in love. His character is Scottish, and the one uh, person he's talking to says, do you actually eat haggis? And he goes, no, I find it repellent. I think most Scottish cuisine was invented on a dare. So, there, yeah, anyway. yeah, yeah. I haven't had haggis. I hear that you can make it. I had a, a friend who was from Scotland who uh-huh. was a vegetarian. She said you can make vegetarian haggis. And, I, and then my first thought was, why? Yeah. But what do they contain it in? I mean, it's supposed to be in the stomach. I don't know. I didn't inquire. Do they have I, vegetarian stomachs? <laughs> the stomach of a vegetarian, I guess. Maybe you can get them on a loophole. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You're a vegetarian, right? <laughs> How much can you eat? Oh, okay. Just come come on over. We'll prepare the haggis together. You can stay overnight. Stay overnight. Yeah, yep, yeah. yep. Made of real vegetarians. So the loop, do you have any thoughts that when you think of loop, I mean, I think you, when I think of you and art, artistic stuff, I think you do jewelry and stuff. Don't you make loops with jewelry? Don't you think of that? Or Yes, definitely. Well, there's a couple of things. Let me talk about jewelry for just a couple of minutes. Please. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. Jewelry and jewelry, people use a loop. L-O-U-P-E. Okay. And it's a small magnifying glass. Oh. Okay, you, it's used by jewelers and watchmakers. Right. And it's from French. The word loop in French means magnifying glass. Okay. And it says from the French late 19th century, but then I looked at the engram. Ah! <laughs> oh, my gosh. And it says it's... <laughs> Mark it in the record book. She looked at the Engram yeah, viewer. I think so. It started in 1800, which is not the late 19th century. Mm-hmm. And it was like not way low. It was like in the middle, like it had been used uh-huh. quite a bit, you know. Yeah. So, But anyway, so anyway, there's the jeweler's loop, but it's really other than the fact that it's usually a circle and in a loop of metal, which has nothing to do with it. That's just another a uh, word that sounds like it. But yeah, you make uh, loops. You can buy jump rings. They're called G- J-U-M-P, jump. Okay. But they are loops of metal. 
Okay. Usually they have a break in them so that you can attach things easily or you can make your own. There's a little, they call them jigsaws, but they're not like a saw or anything. Uh, you loop wire around a pig, oh, okay. a round pig, yeah. or you can make little helixes. Mm-hmm. I think they would be. Are helixes loops? Are rings loops? Yes. I guess it would depend on the perspective, right? Your perspective. Right, if you're looking right, at right. it from one direction, it can appear like a loop. If you're going to make a whole bunch of jump rings yourself, you do a loop, a, a helix, and you just keep wrapping it around the same size thing, and then you cut it down the middle, right. and you have a bunch of jump rings. Anyway, so there's that. Uh, you know, and there's, I mean, you make loops in all kinds of uh, hobbies and stuff that you do. But yeah, there's uh, jump rings, I would say, was, is the biggest loop in uh, jewelry. So you think about jewelry a little bit. What else do you think about uh, yeah. when you think about loop? Because I think about where you're located in Chicago. I was going to say a famous area of Chicago is called the loop. Mm-hmm. L-O-O-P. It used to be kind of like downtown, but Chicago has moved around a little bit. It's an area where the train, the L tracks, loop around this area. Mm-hmm. The loop is not a circle. It's kind of a rectangle with smoothed out corners. It's like an oblong, but it still loops around, makes a complete loop around. And they've called it that since around 1900. Yeah. 1898 or 1897 or something, I think was our first subway. And the L and the subway run on the same tracks. Part of the time it runs on the top above, elevated, and part of the time, and then it'll go down into the underground right so and they still call it the l even though it goes underground yeah yeah it's it's just one of those chicago things yeah people think of the l and they think elevated but it goes up and down i mean in the city it doesn't make sense to have it elevated it makes more sense to have it going underneath the buildings and oh yeah where you can get off and go right into your building or whatever right yeah and a lot of downtown a lot of the stops have that they do so, a lot of underground pathways. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. If you look on a map, the Chicago Loop, what state do you think that looks most like? <laughs> so, what are you thinking? I'm thinking uh, Utah. Arkansas or maybe uh, Iowa. It's an oblong. It has other things that go off. Yeah. But the loop itself is an oblong. It doesn't... I am not looking at a map. <laughs> okay. I think we're getting way off. Yeah, I think so. But the Chicago Loop. It doesn't get very close to the lake, no. I can't think of any place where it gets close to the lake. It's maybe six, seven blocks downtown. Uh Uh-huh. Maybe seven blocks to the lake. uh, Right. And that's going through Grant Park. You're talking about the actual L-Track Loop, right? Yes. Yeah, I'm talking about the L-Track. Because on a map, there's a designated area that is known as the loop that includes oh that includes your building <laughs> is also a part You're of that. You're kidding. <laughs> well, I mean I'm like it, a mile and a half from the loop. Oh, Willis, sorry. Willis Tower. Yeah, you're right. Grant Park, Buckingham Fountain, Art Institute, all of those places are the loop. You are north of that. They're not in the L they're a couple blocks away from the L. Yeah, they are a couple blocks well, away from Well, one block, right. one block. It's on Wabash and right. they're on Michigan. But that's just one of those things, I think, that has changed in time, probably since, I mean, the 40s, 50s, mm-hmm. uh, 1940s, 50s and stuff. It was more inclusive, or maybe even in the early 90s. 1900s and i think it has changed yeah and i don't know if people they say that they're going to the loop you know necessarily i think when you talk about the loop you're talking about the l now that you mention that 
when people say they're going to the Loop, they could be going to the Art Institute. They could be going to Sears Tower, Willis Tower, whatever it is now, Tower, you know. Yeah. Sure. I agree. Grant Park is another one. Yeah. Millennium Park is what they mention here. Buckingham Fountain. Do you remember the, do they still do Buckingham Fountain like late night lighted things? Yeah, sometimes. I don't know if they do it as regularly as they used to. Okay. Money. Supposedly they cut our fireworks. We were supposed to have fireworks twice a week. Wednesday oh. and Saturday. Yikes. And supposedly they cut that a couple of years back. Okay. But I mean, I can hear them. Right. Right. And it seems to me uh, they're doing it on Wednesday. On Wednesday, they do it at like 9 15 or something. Right. And on Saturday, but at 10. And I can hear them both days. So maybe they went back to doing it. Hmm. Those fireworks they do in the loop. Right. Seems like a tremendous so. waste. I don't know, lighting stuff off and shooting it into the air seems like a carbon footprint sort of. And the money, it does, it costs a lot of money every single time they do it. So twice a week. What else do you think of? Well, I think of music now that we have, I I call them M3P, MP, MP, (laughs) here I go again, MP3 players. Mm -hmm. I, I read one article that said that formula is now considered dead. Okay. Because you've got iTunes and all these other things that you don't need a little device for. Oh, you mean like MP3 players are dead? Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because the format is still around. Yeah, I know. And then I read something else that said, oh, yeah, we're still going. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, you can loop. You like a song a lot. You like an album a lot. Just loop it a hundred times or so. Yeah. You can, <laughs> to make everybody around you angry. Though I refer to it as repeat, but at the same time, sure. that's what part of the loop. It's a repeating sort of pattern, right? It is. It's, so. a, it's a loop. I'm sorry. It's a loop. <laughs> because you have a beginning. Let's say you have a curated list, like a mix. A mixtape, perhaps. Yeah. Yeah. A little shout out to my weekly mixtape. Yeah, that I hope everybody listens to. Yep. After they listen to yours. Of your course, podcast. of course. Priorities. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, that's a loop. You want to play it over and over again? Mm-hmm. That's a loop, especially if you've got it on whatever today's music is. If it's not MP3, I don't know what you call it. Computer music. Computer <laughs> <laughs> Computer music. <laughs> Recursion. Yeah, I was going to talk about that because that's that's okay, one thing I I'll think I'll let of. you do that. The second thing I thought of oh, was okay. uh, when I took Fortran right. in college, one of the basic things we learned was about recursion, mm-hmm. recursive things. Yep. You try something and if it works, I mean, it doesn't work. You keep trying, you keep going around and try it and keep going around. And then finally something works and it spits out of the uh, loop. Right. Can repeat itself indefinitely or yeah. until a satisfactory outcome. Yeah. You don't necessarily want it to repeat indefinitely in a program because you need No, you don't. Yeah. If you if you have that, then you might want to go back and look at the program. Yeah. Well, either that or change ten print, blah blah blah. Yeah. Twenty go to ten. For some reason that was always fun to have that happen on a screen when you were doing basic. That was like the first program I wrote. Was 20 go to 10? I didn't do basic because I was above that. (laughs) Whatever. I'm too good for basic. Mm. Uh, Yeah, I did Fortran and everybody out there listening is going, what's What's Fortran? Fortran, For God's sake. I mean, history, my dears. I had to take Fortran 77 as one of my programming classes. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's still around. I think most people do C or Python or But I mean, the whole structure of a loop in programming is a key concept that's pretty much in any programming language. Right. It doesn't matter what program. I just, you know, it was Fortran for me. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what it was. I think of if then statements and loops. Yes, exactly what I was thinking. Yeah. Or for loops or do while loops do a certain set of things while this condition is true kind of deal. Those are the ones that I think of. So, right. Did you like programming? Because for me, it just seemed like a chore. You know, not in a bad way. Oh my God, I loved it. It's kind of funny that we're talking about loops and I found it repetitive. But 
it yeah, was just kind yeah, of right. that was what it was for me it was like okay so if i want to do it i can do it in a pinch but it's not something i enjoy doing i loved it fortran is so clear very intuitive language. i'd like to say base yeah intuitive i'd like to say basic but it's not basic capital b you know you learn a little bit and then you just go to town right with it first the fact that i married the teacher was maybe something else again but womp, womp. <laughs> You do know Tom was my uh, yes. Fortran teacher. Yeah. Okay. I do know this. <laughs> but I loved it by itself. It doesn't matter. I loved the computer language. Did you continue doing, I mean, did you utilize programming stuff in your grade school? Did you use programming like, you know, they've got these math lab things that have, that are similar to programming languages. Oh, that where kind you can of, do. no. No, I didn't. And and uh, grade school? No, I'm sorry. I was in middle school. <laughs> but no. Uh, well, I'm sorry. I, have, I apologize. Middle school, grade school. Whatever. <laughs> <sighs> um, for the longest time, we didn't have computers. But I'm talking like later I on. Mean, I think we were way behind. Right. No, because the computers were taken up by other people, like vocational people. Uh, for, and we didn't have classroom sets. Okay. okay. And so uh, we used very little, hmm. you know. So no, I, I did not get to do that with the class. I wonder if they do it differently these days, but it seems to me to make sense to have just a, a classroom for computers where you've got your computers there. That's what they did. And then you just rotate in as you need it. Oh, oh so that's what they did. Okay, good. They had, and then they ended up with like two classrooms mm -hmm. because the people wanted it so much. And then when I was uh, teaching science the last few years, we actually had a portable bunch of laptops. Oh, wow. Small laptops yeah. that we could roll into the room. Okay. And all the kids would get one to do whatever research they needed to do. But I never did any kind of programming with them. Gotcha. Uh, how about you? So, so you just didn't utilize it in your day to day life. So, you, but I mean, it was just more of a hobby for you learning that stuff, or did you think you were going to? Well, no, it was it was a math class. I had to take uh, for my master's degree. I had a math endorsement, is what they used to call them. Okay. And I had to take so many math classes that I hadn't already taken. Okay. For my bachelor's. So unique. This was in the math department. And I was interested, mm -hmm. so I took it. Yeah, and I'm very happy I did. So you can make me a, a game in Fortran, is what you're saying? Not anymore. Not anymore. I mean, geez, I can hardly do mental math anymore. <laughs> you know? Well, yeah, you, you know, you, seriously, if you don't use it, you lose it. Right. Seriously. However, you know that your brain did it, which is a loop. So, right? I guess. Yeah. Yeah. You're calling on something you re remember and you're doing it right, again. Right, right. That's a loop. Right. Memory. To me, it's it's like a muscle memory kind of thing, except it's mental. Yeah. Uh, once you get started and have a few hints, you did it before, you can still do it right. with some uh, help starting. Yeah. Maybe some cocaine. Uh, no. Which, <laughs> not Adderall. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not uh, I'm not privy to all the current drug uses. I know, I do. So looping in computer programming is one that I think of. Do you think of roller coasters at all? Did you ever Well, I kept going through my my head loop the loop, but no, I'm not a roller coaster person. I've been on simple ones, but I never went upside down on one. Okay, so you've never been on any of the looping roller coasters. Right. Because the just the, ones that go up and down. Right. Because the vertical loop is sort of in a teardrop shape as opposed to an actual circle. Yeah. One of the first vertical loops in history can be traced back to the nineteen fifties. Really? Centrifugal Railway and Poo S. I don't know, Wikipedia. I think someone may have put Poo S in there. Poo S? Yeah. P -O -O. Oh U S. U.S. Oh, no. No, it P -O -O? says... P-O-O? Yeah, it says P-O-O-S. Maybe that's what happened when you went on the ro roller yeah, coaster. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> either, either poo or S or both. But anyway. Yeah, right. The first sea lion park. Did you ever go to Coney Island? No. In 
the late 19th century. The first attempt was called the Flip Flap Railway. And it was mm. just a perfect circle, it looks like. Really? Yes. And most people wanted to watch it as opposed to ride it. Yeah. Duh. I would think. Yeah. <laughs> and then the next attempt, also at Coney Island, was Loop the Loop. Huh. It was a two track steel roller coaster that operated for nine years one of the first looping roller coasters. That is one also that used modern teardrop-shaped loop and a steel structure. So it learned from the perfect circular loop. Yeah. But vertical loops weren't attempted again since Coney Island until the design of the Great American Revolution at Six Flags Magic Mountain, uh, which opened in 1976. So that is the... Really? Yeah, that is the modern looping roller coaster 1976 huh uh what is a clothoid um a bot made of cloth no uh, this is a math thing is it i don't know spell it c-l-o-t-h-o-i-d no i don't know clothoid clothoid i don't know it's an euler spiral oh okay i did not know that's, that that's how you pronounce e-u-l-e-r right euler, euler yes yeah. e-u yeah so what kind of spiral yeah, it's a, a curve whose curvature changes linearly with its curve length. Euler spirals are also commonly referred to as spiros, clothoids, or cornu spirals. Okay, I, I did not know that. I skipped that part day, I guess. <laughs> Skip that day of math? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Essentially, you know, you, if you describe it, it is a teardrop shape. Upside down teardrop. That's the, that's the loop. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. You know, looping roller coasters. In 2000, the modern looping wooden roller coaster, Son of Beast, at Kings Island. The W O O D E N. Correct. Wow. Yeah. And that was after my stint in the uh, American Coaster Enthusiasts. I did go to Kings Island. Yeah. And rode a couple of roller coasters, including the Beast. Ah. Okay. That's when Dad was encouraging me to follow what I liked which was roller coasters <laughs> yeah, at the time. Right, right. So yeah, the, the looping roller coasters, that's one thing I think of is roller coasters that have that form to it are called loops. Right. Even, and then the track itself, all roller coasters, typically ones that aren't lines, like there was one called the tidal right. wave, which I'm only calling um, these ones as I know from the amusement parks I've been to. Right. Yes, formerly known as the tidal wave, first installation of a shuttle loop. So it's one of those ones where it just goes back and forth on a track. There's a weight that drops and it pulls it around the loop and then goes up and then goes back. Yeah. There was one called Montezuma's Revenge <laughs> at Knott's Berry Farm. I remember going on that one. It was a really fast one because oh, it was geez. short. Yeah, but it was uh, the same same design, the same company that made it anyway uh -huh, uh huh looping roller coasters not your bag baby no not mine there is still one mathematical thing that we uh, haven't talked about yet as far as loops in, in the f field of t topology oh okay which is euler euler was topology right and that would be the mobius strip yes which is a strange loop mm -hmm. if you would like to talk about it yeah, go ahead. I mean, if you if you did research on it, let's do it. No, I didn't. I mean, I've known Mobius. Well, no, I've known Mobius Strip since, um, you know, I was a kid. Oh, yeah. That was one of the first things I think my father taught me with like paper craft kind of thing. You take a strip of paper and then you turn it once and you connect it. And then you've got a Mobius Strip, which has one side. Also known as a Mobius loop, Mobius band, Mobius strip. It was discovered, quote unquote, discovered by Jonathan Benedict Listing and August Ferdinand Mobius okay. in 1858. Oh. But it had already appeared in Roman mosaics from the third century. I would think some of those old Greek uh, guys would have figured, not necessarily mathematicians, scientists, whatever, philosophers you know, would have figured it out. Like Socrates? Of course they did. Yeah, 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 Socrates. <laughs> he, uh, Bill and Ted's excellent adventure, mispronunciation of Socrates. Now those I've seen, I love them. Oh, 
Bill and Ted's? Yeah. So, yeah, the Mobius strip is a non-orientable surface, meaning that within it, one cannot consistently distinguish clockwise from counterclockwise turns. It's, it's on the top. It's on the bottom. It's on the... Wait, wait. Yeah. Right. Abstract topological space has only a single boundary curve. When you're a kid, that was really an interesting, like, oh, wow, you know. Oh, yeah, it was. I remember drawing the line on it, you know, just to prove, to show that it was yeah, right. a single line all the way through. The Museum of Science and Industry had a little car on a Mobius strip that was kind of, you know, an automated car. Oh, yeah. And it would ride, it would drive around the Mobius strip showing you that it was only one side because it would go all around. It would go on the inside and then it would go on the outside. Kind of an interesting looking thing. A little more exciting than a pencil line, even though with the pencil line, it's your hand that did it, Mm -hmm. you know. But yeah, the little car would be really uh, neat. Yeah. They used to have a good math section at the Museum of Science and Industry. Yeah, how is that? How is that? Hold on. I'm guessing you've never, you haven't been there since, but yeah, I go, I go sometimes, not, not too often. Yeah, um, they have special exhibits, and I'll go. It's still good. It's still very popular. Mm-hmm. They have a lot of new exhibits. They've gotten rid of some, like the math exhibit, which was small, but it was still good. Right. It's still popular. They still have the whole mine, the big train. Yeah. You know. The U-505 submarine. Uh, You're about to enter the U-505. The trophies in this room were taken from the submarine at the time of its capture, May 23rd, 1943, or I don't know. You you used to work there, didn't you? Yeah, I did. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) That's, I mean, that's a great summer job for when you're in college. Yeah. Welcome to the Hall of Presidents. I don't know. I could probably do a, a good tour guide. Maybe that's something I should look into. It, I mean, was it, you said the same thing over and over and over again for an entire summer. Yeah, kind of a loop. Definitely a loop. Okay, Nora, you're up. <laughs> okay. This is the U5. This is really cramped. It, uh, boy, it was. Oh, yeah, it was uh, you tiny. Take, you take, you're taking people in there, mm-hmm. and it's like, you know, watch your head. Right. Uh, you know, watch your step. Yes, indeed. This is where they all slept. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Not on top of Yeah, yeah. It was really cool. You know, didn't go through it more than a couple times, but, you know. Right. For some reason, we really liked the coal mine, the, the working coal mine. Yeah. Which... They, they didn't let uh, any of the students or any of the uh, summer student work workers do the coal mine. I think it was too dangerous or something. Oh, okay. Yeah, because I mean, they and the speaking of loops, they had conveyor belts down there, and yeah, oh yeah, that's a that's a form of loop, right? Other loops they had at the Museum of Science and Industry, they had this big train, model train. Yeah, I don't know if it's a H O or O or what scale it was. It was a big one. Yeah, it was one somebody might have in their home if they had a big space. But it was uh, a very large uh, expanse. Oh yeah, that they had it. 50 feet by 50 feet or something larger. A lot of loops at the science and industry. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Let's go into games. What do you think? Yeah, because my notes are all done. Okay. So games it is. What do you think of the significance of a loop in a game is? Well, there's the card game War. Uh Uh-huh. And seriously, I mean, you have uh, equal stack, two people equal stack of cards mm-hmm. and you play the same way over and over and over again. So right. you're like doing the same thing over and over again mm-hmm. until something changes. And that would be that one person no longer has cards. Okay. Is that a loop? Yeah. I mean, it's a looping set of instructions, right? A loop. Yeah. Right. 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 Yeah. No, I, and, I can't really talk that much about the games because I don't, you know, I play very simple ones. Uh But even in those, especially one that's not necessarily a linear story or something that you play through to the end, there are systems in games, even if they're telling a linear story, that are looping mechanics. Okay. You're introduced to a type of move or thing and... You continue to use that move or thing 
throughout the game and then sometimes they iterate on it and make it different or you can change it but it's a sequence that you're playing through you're using the same stuff over again kind of thing right 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 theoretically those are things that you play in a game you're doing the same things you're raiding the village or right ra- doing this thing but it's the same mechanics you're using over maybe a little bit different right and also there are things where you want a compelling gameplay loop in a game to keep you interested and keep you okay coming back for more so part of having a compelling gameplay loop is iterating right and you being a mathematician you know what iterating is (laughs) of course the opposite of reiterating but not really it's not really opposite is it It's not the opposite. Yeah, it's another one of those words like inflammable. But, okay, you remember the the Donut County? Yeah. You go to a certain area and you play through it Mm -hmm. and you get collect all the things. Right. And then, okay, good, yay, you won this area. Right. And then you go to another one and you do the same thing. You you collect things using a hole Mm -hmm. to get things to fall into it. And maybe the things are in a different place. It's a different situation. It's a cactus instead of a whatever. Right. But every time you go to a different little area, you're basically doing the same thing. Correct. So that's kind of. That is the gameplay loop. Right. I mean, there are loops within a loop in any game, but that is a good example. Donut County. And then sometimes they iterate on it where. The hole is now filled with water, but it's still the same. It's still using the same mechanic. You just have to figure out how to use it. Right. And then there's also repetition in these things as far as you would expect for loops. Not only are you repeating a certain set of instructions, but also there's replayability concerns too, where it's like Uh you're going through, you're doing the same types of things, but then when you come back through again... Is it enjoyable? Is it fun? Is it constantly evolving? What is it doing? And gameplay loops are very important in any kind of game, not just thematically. Looping mechanics are very important because you want to keep people engaged. And if you don't do it just right, it becomes repetitive. Right. You want a, a loop that iterates upon itself in such a way that keeps you coming back in a loop. Yeah. There's a comfort to it. Oh, yeah. In knowing, but then you still want something a little bit different. Right. But still, you want that comfort. Yeah. Remember when you played Katamari Damacy? That's got a very simple kind of... Oh, yeah. 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 It's very simple gameplay sort of loop. The whole thing, you can explain it to anyone. It's like you've got a ball, you're rolling stuff up, it gets bigger as you roll stuff up, and you can only roll up smaller stuff to larger stuff. Right. That's the gameplay loop. And it's a very important part that people refer to as far as something being not only replayable, but enjoyable. Because if you're doing the same thing over and over again and it's not fun, well, right. you don't have a compelling, fun game. Okay. So so even my simple games. Yeah, they have gameplay loops in them because you're doing the same thing. You're, you're doing the same sort of thing, except that they keep adding a little bit here, right? a little bit there that makes it a little different, a little more difficult. Yeah, but. exactly. Like Bejeweled, right? You've got your... Your different things. Well, I don't play that, but yeah. Well, what do you play? <laughs> Cookie jam. Okay. It's a match three thing, right? Yeah, it's a match three thing, right. And so you start out, it tells you that you match three and you do this thing. Matching four does something different. Matching five does right. something even more that kind of adds some variety to it. And then also there's a puzzle aspect where each puzzle orientation mm-hmm is different in such a way and then you have obstacles that they add right to those puzzles as they get harder like cookies that maybe you have to crunch them twice or three times or whatever before yeah, they disappear yeah, yeah that's what i mean by iteration right yeah i understand all this wow i mean I, in the gaming mm-hmm. i always thought it would be more to the kind of games that you normally would play right but it does fit to the match threes that i do Mm -hmm. i mean and and and, i understand that yeah yeah but but then also even in games that have story i mean there are things that you repeat even something like horizon forbidden west where i'm taking down dinosaurs Mm -hmm. i'm looking at you know which dinosaurs and i gotta figure out the way to do it most efficiently yeah each time i do that that's i'm doing the same thing over again i'm just taking down a dinosaur but it's like i've got options that's one thing that 
certain loops that in games you need to have your options. You have to have some diversity in what you're doing or else it just becomes boring and repetitive. Right. It becomes a loop, but not in a good way. Yeah, yeah. Over and over and over again. Yeah. So there's a particular game that I am playing right now by a company. Well, it's by Arcane Studios. Bethesda Software is who published it. Since Bethesda has been acquired by Microsoft, it's one of, I'm guessing, probably one of the last games I'm going to see from Bethesda. Uh or arcane in a while because they're going to make them exclusive but but anyway this game is called death loop okay have you seen any movies or any tv shows that have to do with a loop occurring in time i probably used to did you ever see groundhog's day oh yeah yeah did you not but see lo- that gets boring i'm sorry okay so you don't like that didn't grab your attention then but i i did like what what's the one with michael j fox uh and Christopher, what's his name? And the car. Oh, God. It's famous. Back to the Future. You're talking about Back, Back to, the, to future. the Future. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that's less about a loop, right? That's more about... Oh, okay. Isn't it? Yeah, you're right. You don't get stuck. You just go back and forth and here and there. Yeah, and you change things and it, it's not like you're stuck. You're on a path linearly. You're going back. You're changing something, but you're still going forward. Yeah, you're right. How about Russian Doll? Oh, yeah. Well, that's definitely a loop, but things change in that loop. Did you see the first? You saw the first season, right? No. What? I just read about it. Oh. And I said, oh, sounds like Groundhog Day. The name of it is because the little, the Matryoshkas, Matryoshkas, whatever they are. The little nesting. They're within little uh, dolls within other little dolls within other little dolls within, you know. And I do think I'll watch it sometime. You know, it's got some things where it is repetitive but there are things that change about the day subtly as she's discovering what's going on okay she starts out living the same day over and over and over again but then she realizes as she interacts with things and people and learns new stuff other things start happening other little changes get introduced as she goes on yeah which is you know not something that happened in groundhog's day which it was the same day over and over again, and he was just exploring that day. Yeah. I'll, I should watch it again, because it's been a long time. Yeah. Groundhog Day, yeah. I think it's a fun comedy. It does have kind of a cutesy love story. I guess some people find it fun to figure out how long he was stuck in the loop before he breaks it. Ah. Uh. Because there's a lot of theories. Some people say it's like 10,000 years. Some people say it's 100 years. <laughs> because of the things that he learned, like... He learned how to play a piano. He learned how to oh yeah, yeah, ice sculpt. But when you start doing that, you kind of lose the whole point of the movie, which is it's just he's trying to, he goes through this whole stages of grief sort of arc as he's coming to terms with who he is and what he cares about. And he sort of falls in love in this loop with one of the characters. So I don't know. I like the movie. I usually watch it every Every Groundhog's Day, because it's ridiculous to do so. (laughs) Actually, I read a book in one of my book clubs Mm -hmm. uh, called The Seven Deaths of Evelyn Hardcastle. Oh, okay. And uh, it's it's kind of a science fiction fantasy book. When I was reading it, I did not know that. I just got, it was book club, I got the book, I started reading it, and I was going, Jesus Christ, what's going on here? You know, but what happens is this woman, there's one man and he meets this woman Evelyn Hardcastle and she's going to die and he, he he keeps trying to save her but he comes in as different people mm-hmm. the guests at a party right but his whole premise of the book is he's trying to save her oh okay so she dies seven times but I uh, the, the last time isn't that wonderful he saved her <laughs> well I, is... actually I don't even remember that's a loop Right. Any character that's reliving the same thing over and over again, I would say that's kind of a time loop. Something like a Back to the Future. I mean, he is still experiencing things, but they're changing every time he, you know what I mean? Like he goes, he can go to another day, but something has changed. It's not exactly the same. I think you were right. I think Back to the Future is not technically a loop. Yeah. It's like the time machine. It's, It's totally not the same. Yeah. 
There's this movie that's called Looper. Ah. Yeah, did you ever? Never heard of it. Bruce Willis and Joseph Gordon-Levitt. It is a crime-filled future. This character is an assassin. They work for a, an organization. And what they will do, so they've got tracking systems in 2074. Every person is tracked. So what they have to do is they have to go that's back. That's the and, future? <laughs> That's the present too. But anyway. I'm going to find that little microchip. If I... <laughs> yeah. It's difficult to dispose of a body in the present. So they've got these people called loopers that will take people back to a certain time and kill them there because there's no, <laughs> there's no trace. And then at a certain point, you have to travel to whatever time it is and kill yourself and you get gold bars because you don't want to have the person who does this living past a certain time. So you need oh, to, yeah, 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 yeah. It's kind of an interesting movie, sort of messes with your brain a little bit, but it's like an interesting premise. Yeah. yeah. I don't think technically it is a time loop. It's more of a time travel movie. Sounds like it, but what do I know? I mean, you know, there are tons of these time loop movies Edge of Tomorrow, Happy Death Day. Did you ever see Happy Death Day? Of course not. Of course not. It's like one of those <laughs> slasher pictures, except this girl keeps on living the day, same day over again and keeps on getting killed. Hmm. And she's got to figure out who the creepy guy killing her over and over and over again is. Over, yeah, yeah. Or creepy slasher, right? But anyway. That's okay. You can, you can have that one. Okay. <laughs> Just watch Groundhog's Day and we'll, maybe Looper, yeah, yeah. you know, you'll be fine. Palm Springs was another one that was kind of a comedy that was sort of fun. I think it's on Netflix. But anyway, but back to the game, Death Loop. Yeah. And the premise, you are this character named Colt. He is stuck in the this time loop. It seems to be that he and someone else kind of remember going through this loop. But what happens to Colt is the first time he's in, he he forgets himself. He forgets things uh -huh. about what happened and doesn't know why. And so the person who is only consistent is this other character named Juliana who communicates with you uh. and basically taunts you. It's like, I'm going to come after you and I'm going to kill you every time and send you back and loop you, which is someone kills you. You go back to the beginning of the morning. Okay. So the game play itself is you've got four different areas. You can have four different times of day in each one of these areas. So okay. you've got morning, afternoon, evening, late night. You can play through those, but if you die at any point, it sends you back to the very beginning. Oh, yeah. And the whole day itself is repeating over and over again. Like I said, the only people who remember are Juliana and you, but when you got there, you had amnesia and you don't. Okay. You meet other versions of yourself along the way. What you decided that you're going to do is you're going to break the loop and you have to eliminate these different visionaries and also Juliana in order to break the loop. Uh -huh. So you've got to figure out how you're going to do this to eliminate all seven of them in a single, in a single go. Oh. Yeah. Okay. So that's sort of the, there's a sort of a puzzle solving thing to it. You're learning things by playing through the loop, by playing through different levels. You find notes, you find notes to yourself. Uh -huh. It's just air writing, floating, saying, watch out or whatever stylistically it's the 1950s 1960s style interesting it is an interesting game i do enjoy playing through it it does have enough variety for me uh-huh you know you can find secret weapons the only problem i have i mean problem it's not really a problem it's like this is why I don't like people who rank i mean it's, it's not like i don't like people who rank the games <laughs> it's got really high ratings and I understand that there's a discrepancy between the high ratings of people who review the game and people who play the game. There's, you know, right. a difference on a scale of one to 10 of probably about two or three. I don't like using the scale points, but for me, there are some things about this game that I don't think were done very well. 
I, I think the concept is awesome. You know, the whole theme, kind of a shaft kind of character. Okay. And the story is unique. You learn things about the story as you continue going through these loops. But when it's introducing you to these mechanics, it's not clear enough in tutorials. So ah. what you have to do at a certain point is you have to get this special power that you can harvest. It's this substance called residium. What you need to do as you find weapons throughout the game, they don't carry with you into the next loop unless you infuse them with residium which you find as you play through the level that you can pull out so you can use it. Every time you die, you have basically three chances before you're looped. Okay. Each Eternalist in the game, these radicals that you have to eliminate, have a specific power, a stone that they wear that will allow them to do certain things. They've got special powers, like one makes you invisible, one allows you to transport yourself across distances. One makes you have powers that you can lift and throw people. Your one that you have from the get-go is it will rewind you, but you lose all your residium. Ah. But you can go back to you and harvest it from the dead you. But you that's your power is you can repeat two, three times in a single time of day before you are eliminated and have to repeat the whole loop over again. Uh huh. So it's a sort of a combination of things where you got to figure out where the different Eternalists are during certain times of day. You reveal that by playing through over and over again. And then also as you find these different clues throughout the game, there are things that you can open. There's things you can discover as far as weapons, special weapons. I've got one of these weapons that's just basically a, a prototype laser that's super handy. Once you get them, you infuse them with residium. The problem is it doesn't explain this to you very clearly. Ah. So... All the things that you collect, even like enhancements to weapons, enhancements to your powers, even the stones themselves, you have to infuse them with residium or you lose them. And it didn't make that very oh, okay. clear oh, okay. the first time through, even through the intro, like, you know, they're trying to teach you how to play the game, right? It's not clear that you have to do that. And so it took me a couple times through before I realized that was yeah. what I had to do. That's one thing that's annoying. You don't read the gaming news. No, I don't. <laughs> so you don't know about, there's a big kerfuffle going on about this game that was released on Xbox, an Xbox exclusive. I, I mentioned the fact that this company, Bethesda, oh yeah, they released a game Arcane, originally a French company. Hold on. Where is it? Redfall. So this game, Redfall, is supposed to be a cooperative game involving vampires. And they each vampire, you have powers, there's skill trees. Do you know what I mean when I say skill tree? Well, I have some ideas, but if somebody forced me to say, I'd say, I don't know. Okay. Well, it's a tree structure, and you can assign points to different levels of the tree to unlock different powers. It's essentially like, you know, like a family tree, but think of each one of those dots that connects is a different power. So that's a skill tree sort of structure. Okay. So it's got that for powers and things. The problem is, not only is it plagued with bugs... According to, I haven't played it, so I can't say. Yeah, yeah. You know, for certain, but a lot of people are saying this. And then also what they're saying is that the AI is really dumb. Oh. The non-player enemies, you can really trick them easily. So oh. let's go back to Deathloop. As I was playing through, I figured out once these characters, not the Eternalists per se, but the other supporting thugs are aware of your presence, you're notified that they know where you are. So they start attacking you, right? Well, I mean, it's very easy to not only draw their attention to one spot and then move around, 
to another spot. It's super easy as long as they don't see you. One time I got a guy who is behind a window who throws these paint bombs at you. Or if he's right in front of you, he can rush you and blow you up. Oh. Right? <laughs> so I saw that he was throwing these paint bombs at me. He was throwing them out a window. So I saw he was about winding up, and then I moved slightly to the left, and he threw it right into the window and blew himself up. That's stupid AI. <laughs> That's, yeah. I don't yeah, want to say yeah. stupid AI. It's dumb. It doesn't make any sense that you would throw something into a window, but whatever. Right. So. The AI doesn't seem super duper clever, is is my point. Yeah, yeah. The gameplay is fun. I like unlocking little pieces of the story. There are things that you can figure out and find. Like it took me a while to figure out how to unlock that laser, which is super handy. And you've got a hacking mechanism that you have to use to unlock various spots. Sometimes maps will be a larger, wider area in certain times of day than others, so there's a little diversity there. Oh. It does a lot well, but then again, I wouldn't call it a perfect game. I wouldn't call it 10 out of 10. I would call it somewhere like, <laughs> it's a good game. It's a, it's good. Yeah. It's got its good things and bad things. I've, I'm about probably... Sounds like a six. I would say a seven. I mean, because it's enjoyable. I'm still playing it. I'm about 45 hours of play time through. Jeez. Like, playing through the loop. Yeah. Well, I mean... <laughs> It's not like I'm playing every time during the day. It's no, like I've been I playing know, this I game know. for weeks and weeks, right? I say I say geez, but if you count the amount amount of time that I play like Mahjong Dimensions. Right. Uh I, a little bit, sometimes for hours every day. But if you add it all up for a month, it's probably more than forty five hours. Yeah. So I should not say it. <laughs> It's also when I load up my PlayStation, it says, Oh, you've been playing this game for X amount of hours. I don't know how far I am in the story, and I did restart as I was learning the game mechanics. I restarted a couple times, but I mean, it's fun. I'm still having fun with it. I'm still enjoying the sneaking around and stuff. It does seem a little on the easy side. If you get certain powers or certain modifiers, the shooting mechanics are a little off, but I mean, it's fun. It's still fun to play. I'm enjoying myself. Right. 50 hours in and that's not a bad game that's not a six that's true oh one other thing i didn't mention is i found a little bit of a bug where there are modifiers that you have on these stones once you kill one of the eternalists multiple times you get upgrades to your stone powers so one of the upgrades is it allows you to float in the air briefly before you like you can do it twice So you can get to further distances teleporting if you have this upgrade. Well, as I went through the loop, I had the upgrade installed, but it didn't recognize it. So I was teleporting myself up and it was, I was falling and killing myself because I would teleport over a thing. And that's happened to me a couple times. And that's one of those annoying bugs that I don't think they're going to fix, but it doesn't feel super buggy. Maybe that was different when it was released. Yeah. I don't agree with the review ratings of your professional reviewers. I am more in line with the reviewers who are actual players. I would agree. Do you ever read those? Re- yeah, I'm, I ask you questions I know the answer to. Do you ever read those reviews? Not for that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things I wanted to mention also about those reviews is when someone reviews something, if they come across a bug that's really annoying, they'll give it a zero, which is not an accurate rating, oh, right? They'll, they'll right, go, right, right. I hate this because of this thing. And it's like, right. they don't have the minimum system requirements. I can't play this on my device. Zero. It's like, oh. <laughs> so you got to kind of take those things into account too. Right. Because it's a different thing than watching a movie. You can't do that with a movie. You can't say, the DVD didn't work on my player so i'm gonna exactly yeah so it's a bad movie exactly you can't do that with like that kind of but you can do that with games so i think that's something that makes the reviewing of a game less accurate if you want to say accurate it's still a matter of opinion but the concreteness of the criteria is it's too all over the place right to really even 
think that that's accurate. When you're talking about it, I'm thinking it depends on the reviewer, because right. I'm sure there are a few reviewers who think of all the different uh, positive perspectives. Right. Their review might be more accurate, and you learn those reviewers, and they're the uh, ones that you, when you read, mm-hmm. tend to believe. Right. But like I said, few and far between. A lot of the media outlets get pre-release codes so they can review the thing before it actually comes out. Ah. So whatever they get is not the released, you know what I mean? It's not in the same state as it is actually released. So sometimes you'll get, right, right. like I said, those differences in opinions because it doesn't take into account the day one patch or whatever. A day one patch is is something that since now we can have all this stuff delivered to us, like updates, Uh people have day one patches, which means as soon as you install it, it installs a patch, which never used to be able to happen. But now you can go, oh, that's okay. We'll just, we'll put it out and then fix it later. It's like, eh. Right, right. That's a topic for another day. Yeah. Do you want to talk about any of the wonderful game? No. No, (laughs) your gameplay loop is Mahjong Dimensions. We know that you made that very clear. That's that's what I'm on right now. Yeah. Do you have anything uh, to close the show about the word loop? Any closing thoughts? Has a lot to do with mathematics and mathematics was my chosen field. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And it's partially responsible for finding your second husband. Yes, it is. It sure is. (laughs) <laughs> we learned that. I, you know, it's it's an interesting. We had, I think, we had a, an interesting conversation about a lot of things, and there are so many more we didn't think about. Oh yeah, but it, maybe it's, another show. Maybe I think there is no right answer as someone's perspective about what they think about when they think about a loop. You know, as long as there's some sort of recursion that occurs, you can call going to work every day. You can call that a loop, although. Technically, you're going and you're doing different stuff every day. True. You can call it a loop. I mean, there's so many different things. It's more of a spiral. Yeah. I think. (laughs) As far as loops are concerned, they're a necessary part of programming. Yes. I think of them in a programming sense more than I think of them uh, anything else. But I do think of certain abstract mathematical things like the Mobius strip. The first thing I thought of when you talked about loops was programming computer programming in the time loop thing my gosh that's just one of those it's overplayed kind of like yes. the same day over and over and over again <laughs> let's find something new let's iterate on that yeah so, yeah anyway <laughs> all right well that wraps it all up i want to thank you nora for joining me on the show today talking about loops pleasure was all mine i thank you and Let's close the show like we always do by saying thank you for joining us on this week's episode of the Too Vague Podcast. My name is Ben. And I'm Nora. And we've been your hosts. Have a wonderful night. Bye. Bye.